Hello, hello, hello. Sam Tobert, Sound of Joy Music Services. And here we are doing another impromptu stream. As I'm getting used to doing the, the live streaming uh, uh, podcast type of um, uh, videos, playing around with the time zones is going to be an issue. Of course, I have so many people that listen to me from around the world. It's hard for me to say what's a good time to catch the the majority of people. And usually when I go live, I make up my mind five minutes before I go live. It's a subject that uh, I felt to investigate. Just doing some housekeeping around here. Um, can we save the sound of gospel music? So as people are coming in, I want to just as I always do with some housekeeping. I'm supposed to see my chat window. Oh, there it is. Just want to welcome anyone who comes in or those who will be viewing. I'm going to talk about um, the sound of gospel music in our churches and in the world today. Last time I did this, I spelled the word wrong. Here we go. So, the sound of gospel music, the that clarion call that would start any service in the Pentecostal world uh, through through denominations. I think we try to link or to attach gospel music to one to one race of people. They generally say black gospel music, white gospel music. In that case, you can have uh, Indian gospel music. You can have Russian gospel music. You can have uh, European gospel music. T musicians look at music as being just music. We don't try to attach uh, precursors to it, although you have those that call jazz. Jazz is, is encompasses everything that has to do with the spirit of the music that's being played by the musician, if he's just a piano player, or by the trio, or by the actual group, or the actual ensemble. When you get to church music, we try to put church music under the umbrella of hymns, anthems, spirituals, and then we break it up into gospel, contemporary gospel, urban gospel. Um, there were some other ones I'm trying to remember. When I was when I was a young musician, um, the gospel music was um, usually derived by James Cleveland, uh, the ward singers, the uh, the quartet sound that was labeled gospel. The soloists who would come up and sing certain songs, they didn't cover. Uh, back in my early days, uh, Tommy Dorsey and his introduction of jazz into the church, which I, as I read and as I do my research, he was shunned for bringing a style of music that was so-called slated for the nightclubs or the, what, they call, what they call back then worldly music. But to look at gospel music as I became up as a young musician and began to, to study and to work with, who joined us? Oh, V-Force, welcome, welcome, Washington State. As I began to study the theory of music and got to learn the, the actual big band sound, jazz sounds, um, Caribbean style music, and then go back to my home church as a youngster and to hear some of the music that was being introduced at that time. My father was a church musician. I recognized the chord patterns. I recognized the passages that Melodies was taking and it began to form in me that it's just music. It's how it is being used, what's being taken off, what's being added to it. So I want to be able to, from my standpoint, again, I'm, I'm a retired church musician. I, d I played for 45 years. I just want to make sure I don't miss anybody. So if you see me looking around, I'm 
moving screens here so I don't miss anyone. I, um, I, I played for 45 years, so I had to learn spirituals, anthems, uh, the early gospel songs, which were done by singers. I learned the what they call male chorus songs, which they usually took from, from quartet sounds. And then I began to learn as the as the Hawkins singers became prominent with their music, I had to now change over the aspect of my chords. And I said, these chords are familiar. They're using chords that I use in jazz band. Oh, I know these chords. And it made it, I, it, made it comfortable for me to be able to now morph into a musician that could adjust on the fly. No longer was it tied to the metering of a anthem sheet music or a, a hymnal where if it's uh, three, four timing, six, eight timing, you were locked into that for the song. But when the music changed over, which quote unquote, we like to call the gospel music, then things began to open up. Now I got to understand what jazz musicians were feeling when they played because they were uninhibited from their music. They weren't tied to this is this note goes here and this note goes there, but what are you feeling at the very moment when that song is being played? Now I'm gonna cover some of those songs that I learned in my early days, and I still play now in a gospel style. So I look to have conversation because I, I realize that everybody um, doesn't go to church, number one. I think on my channel, I've tried to cover every aspect of music from my younger days uh, in, a, in the Kelly Temple Church of God in Christ, Pentecostal church, where gospel music was not shunned, but it wasn't encouraged, but it then morphed into where it became more acceptable because as your choir members got younger, they were, they would say, we don't want to sing the music of the senior choir. We want to do music that, that, that we can feel. So then you begin to have that change over. Now this is of course in the, in the, in the United States on the East coast in the New York city area where there were a tremendous amount of influences in music. Uh, I was speaking with my brother and another young musician on, on my podcast on Facebook earlier today, where he was talking about how the musicians from New York seem to be able to play not just one instrument, but several instruments. And if you came from New York to Chicago, where he was, they knew you were, you were from New York because of your style of music. Uh, and by New York, we mean Philadelphia and Jersey, cause that's really considered tri-state in that, that area. Um, then I had to let him know that my brother and I came up under the under the Church of God and Christ banner where certain music wasn't allowed, but we mixed it in it to sort of, as they say, jazz up the song to give it a little more life to it. And then we've had uh, influences uh, from the Brooklyn uh, Institutional Church of God and Christ and the, and the tremendous music, musicians that were there, Butch Haywood, J.C. White, uh, and then the musicians who were out on Long Island, New York, where they were all skilled uh, I can only call the one name, uh, Professor Willard Meeks, who I, as a young man, marveled at how he could just sit and play so many classical chords behind a, a hymn. These are all the influences that I had. And of course, no one can leave out the godfather of gospel, uh, Reverend, the late Reverend Timothy Wright, where I got an opportunity to serve as his quote unquote jurisdictional musician. He taught the songs and I got a chance to practice and to play those songs, not just locally in different churches, but the few times that we went outside of the church in different venues. So I have a, 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 lo a large pot of quoting of songs that I had to incorporate to give that gospel sound. And as I now listen, because I, even though I'm, I am, re am, I'm a retired musician, I still listen because of the current state of the COVID issues that are happening here in the United States, I get a chance to visit several churches whenever they go live. And I listen to the music intently because I want to hear a sound that has changed from what I used to do, but still familiar. I think I, I always have this, um, this thought that we old timers and I'm, I'm approaching six, I'll be 66 this year in about four months. 66 years old and but I still love music I you know I, I still love this the sound of the spirituals the anthems that I played back then 
the early gospel, those songs still are relative to me. But I also listen to all the newer music, which I don't want to say it has replaced the gospel sound, but it seems to have covered it up. They'll borrow some chords or less less chords and then give a different presentation. So I, I accept that when I was young, they wanted the, at that time, the, I'm going to say, contemporary gospel sound. And as a young musician, I played it and I made it sound like it, like it was from the album. And the, the older people tolerated me and tolerated us younger people as, as we made that presentation on Sundays or at different services. So I have, I have to have that same tolerance when I hear the new music that is coming out now. And, I'll, and I will cover some of that. But I wrote down a couple of songs and I'll cover how the changeover um, to me is kind of covering up that old gospel sound that people of my age group, which there were still a lot of us around, grew up with and occasionally would like to hear. So I'm going to switch you over to switch you over to my next page here where I can bring up this page. I went and I searched because you get a lot of information when you're on the internet. So I searched, what is gospel music? Just a quick summary, a Google search. There are many different, um, many pages that I could have gone to to get this information, but I selected this one because it was kind of, kind of encapsulated most of it. And I read it for you. What is gospel music? Gospel music is, is a style of Christian music that has both inspired and drawn from popular music tra traditions. Now, by the popular music traditions, we've got anthems, spirituals, hymns, jazz, uh, Caribbean styles. Um, uh, I just keep, keep saying Caribbean. I don't want to say Hispanic music because that has a real Caribbean uh, flavor to it. Different flavors of music went into gospel. There's a there's a, a thought that those other genres of music came to the church and took the church music into those genres. And I, I, I have to disagree and debate anyone who did not take music theory when I did to say that Oh, those chords that they play in jazz came from the church. No, it was the other way around. Again, I'll, I'll have that debate because I was a musician back then and I knew the chords that I had to play for anthems and spirituals and they weren't jazz infused. I began to add to what they were doing to give, that, give those songs a little more pop, not without changing them. Let me continue reading. By definition, gospel music can be derived from any number of ethnic styles and religious traditions, but in practice, black American gospel music dominates that dominates the genre. It was nothing for a, uh, back in my days when I was playing for uh, my home church to have tour buses come and bring tourists from Europe and they wanted to come and hear the music in a black church. They wanted to feel, you know, how how can we sing and inspire them with just singing? They may not have understood the words, but they understood the music. As I continue, many gospel songs emerged from traditional church hymns, hymns, period. Over time, gospel began incorporating traits of secular music particularly country music, blues, and ragtime. And I'll, I'll, I'll cover some of that because I, I put in ragtime beats in some of the gospel music, which made the music as, entertain, as entertaining as it was reverent. Period. Gospel's relationship with secular music ran in both directions. Many gospel singers and soloists began their musical journey singing in the church before transitioning to popular, popular music. And let me stop right there so I don't infringe on names. But the term gospel music was in a in a genre sense the combination 
of different styles. Now, if you want to take the hymns, the hymns, which again I am I'm voiced on. Um, if you want to take the hymn, holy, holy, holy. Let me just put on my headset so I can hear the hymn, holy, holy, holy. Fix that up. Very basic. If you played it like the hymn, or the hymnal has it laid out, it has very basic notes. Let me see. I put a little bit of um, chord changes in it to sort of, sort of uh, give it a kind of a uh, gospel feel. But when you really looked at what gospel, got, what the the infusion of the different ethnic styles of music did to a song like "Holy, Holy, Holy," I would take it and I would do on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Kept the melody the same, but now look at all the infusion of jazz chords that I put in there. Seventh chords, uh, diminished chords, because for me, in my in my background, coming up as a musician in, in my high school, we played those chords. So when I was my time to be the musician, I said I could go hymn no, but let's just flavor it up. So, you know, did I ruin that song? Did I change the change how the song can be represented? Or did I make the song did I give another look at it? Welcome, Nepal. Did I give it a a, a different life? Did I did I did I make while I was playing it, someone who was singing it, sing it maybe a little bit stronger and a little bit more fervently because they could identify with chording that they maybe have heard listening to some, some other song on the radio. Again, not everyone in church only listens to church music when they go home. They're listening to the jazz, Earth, Wind, and Fire at that time, uh, Mighty Clouds of Joy, um, Trying to think of some of the singers back then that were also during my time. Uh, Gladys Knight and the Piffs. Some of those chords I was using were in some of those songs, or they were in the jazz greats. Um, trying to remember, because I didn't have a whole collection of jazz songs, but I had a radio when I would drive. I could listen and pick up different chord phrasing. I go, gee, I like the way that sounds. Go home and practice it. And then when I got to play a service, I go, gee, I remember this chord. Let me see, will it fit? In my practice time, I always would add different chords from different genres of music just to be able to see if I can bring it out. Welcome, Dalton. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for coming in. So let me just take you back to my scene here. So as, as it said, many gospel songs emerged from traditional hymns. Over time, gospel began to incorporate traits of secular music now does that mean that we ch again changed the the purpose for the songs we we generally sing songs in church to bring people together in in an actual oneness so hymns were always people in that back then would, would hold a hymn though we're telling them to turn to number 325, and everybody would be hopefully singing together, those who had a voice and who didn't. 
when the gospel music began to become prevalent in churches, we, we now featured choirs. And the choirs, for the most part, did not have hymnals. Because I was a musician who could learn 80% of my songs by listening to an album and then break down the three-part harmony and the instrumental parts of the song, that gave me that freedom now to do the gospel music sound that was emerging, of breaking away from the hymn and breaking away from the anthem. One of those songs I will go to is God Is, done by James Cleveland, who was known as the father of gospel music. Father or Godfather? Let me just look. Everybody was given a term. I think Thomas Dorsey was father. James Cleveland, was he given father or was he given Godfather? Because I remember Timothy Wright was given Godfather. I got to go back and re research all these precursors. To, well, we'll just say God Is by James Cleveland. When I learned that song, no sheet music. All I could do is hear what other musicians was doing. He himself being a musician, when I got to see some of the older uh, videos on YouTube, I could see him actually sitting there playing. If I remember right, I did go to see a Gospel Music Workshop of America um, convention in New York City at Madison Square Garden. And I may have had an opportunity to maybe see him walk past or peep in the door and, and watch him playing. But Again, those were the, the, the sounds of gospel that took musicians out of the hymnal, and basically you needed musicians who could play off the cuff, and the off the cuff musicians were the guys that played jazz. They were the guys that could start a song and play it like they felt it. type of music then the music the the all the piano players were like the lead so they were always down here in the in the, in the lower registers of, of the of the piano and then they would go up I got that from the album. Just to hear that change on the album, I had to hear it in my head and figure out what what the, what are they doing there? God is the joy and the strength of the changes. meticulous movements were all part of the gospel sound. So as a musician, a youngster coming up and been and given or told to go buy the album and learn this song, I had to now relinquish re looking at it on sheet music and allow my ear to memorize every movement of what I heard. Hear the change and then resolve.
this change resolve there and then hit that six chord or D minus seven so gospel music has a um, when you really want to tear it apart and try to understand let me take off your headphones trying to understand what is it supposed to sound like now you see I, I named my company Sound of Joy that's back from 1992 when I first started to create my own music company and I on music services company and I wanted to be a voice for the young musician who wasn't following me back in my early days I was always being slid off the organ or off the piano by more competent m musicians to have people request another musician to play for them for a solo because they weren't comfortable with me, but they had a musician who they had sung with well before I became, uh, before it was my turn, you might say. But when I would look back, I didn't see no one trying to slide me off the organ. And I said, this doesn't look right because how am I going, just as the guys before me would not share their knowledge of what they played, I wanted to be the one guy that will share with every musician who was coming behind me but I did not see them there. So I knew that I would have to help in actually creating them. And when they come, I have to have something for them to be able to learn from. As I say, there was no schools for teaching gospel music back in my day. There were some conservatories in, I believe in Detroit, that would take in musicians. But those, if you weren't from Detroit, like I wasn't, that wasn't open to me. There was no course to say, okay, here's how you learn gospel music, gospel music 101. So I tried to create at that time through paper and then virtually how to uh, get an understanding, number one, of, of what music is, because you got to start someplace. You always start someone, once someone with, here's how you play a scale in this key, and then you learn the scales in every other key, and here's what a basic triad chord sounds like which is what gospel music is a basis of triad chords with a lot of movement around it and then hear all the different other chords the diminished the augmented the uh, the minor chords that help to that help to um encompass around the gospel sorry if i missed anyone that came in elisha thank you why did they do that uh if you're talking about the musicians in my day who would not share with me as I got older, I had to accept the fact that they did not want me to get as good as they were. Now, you might say, that shouldn't be in the church. That shouldn't be a church musician who is being asked by a 15-year-old, hey, how did you learn how to do this? How do you do that? And to have them stop playing or slide their hands away from my eyesight so I couldn't see it, it was kind of dis, uh, I won't say it was encouraging because after a while I just had to, in my mind, remember what I heard and when I got a chance to get to a piano, try to emulate that. I think I've lost five or six years in my own personal growth because the, there was no one to direct me to a music book or direct me to a, a book on chord theory and placement of your hands on certain chords and how to do fingering correctly. Which is why you see me do what I do here on in, in this space. Um, most of my videos, in fact, 100% of my videos will always be overhead. And now that I can have the actual Cordy app playing in the background, you'll see the name of the chords and the fingering of the chords so that I don't hide anything. I don't expect to be here 100 years from now. But if the, if the servers for YouTube are still operational, someone coming up post Sam Talbert can at least look at and say, hey, there's one guy out there who was not afraid to show me what this song sounded like back when he learned it back in his day. So, yes, Elisha, that, um, 
territorial. I'll put it like that. Sometimes we we try to find the worst words to describe how people react with people. I have to find the words that might fit that era. Back in the 70s, musicians were good for sliding each other off the organ to show you how well they could play the song. Well, okay. I think that they they felt purpose in their heart because they would always end with, well, just you know, just keep practicing, and then and then you know, God will 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 give it to you. And again, when you're 15 years old and you just want to learn, because you you come from an um uh, you come from a learning uh what is it when I was in school. Teachers were teaching me how to play the 1812 Overture. They would teach me how to play songs from the um, the um, Chicago group. They would teach me how to play band music. And here I am now in the church, and I got all this theory from being an instrumentalist in me, hearing so many chords in my head. And when I hear a person playing, I want to be able to now, hey, how do you do that trill? How do you play that chord? How do you build from here? You know, it was... I'll, again, I'll use the word discouraging. It didn't stop me, though. It just meant for me, I had to now to be that more determined to see what I can learn on my own. And as you can see, there, there, were, there weren't hundreds of gospel songs. There was the song of that era. If it was the 70s, it was the Hawkins songs. If it got, was the middle of the 70s, it was, it was Andre Crouch. When you got to the 80s, you began to emerge into the big band sounds. These are the, these are the large church choirs from Mississippi Mass Choir, um, Chicago Mass Choir. These, these were the mass choirs that were now emerging, where they were now taken from, changing from the, from the beginning of the, the choir sound to the real huge choirs of 80, 90, 100, 200 members. There's one song I did want to touch on. I wanted to make sure that I won't infringe on that copyright. I'm going to touch on a little bit of it because of, it's, it's very important. In the Church of God in Christ, where I was a member uh, for those years as a musician, we had uh, as the national music director, Dr. Matty, late Dr. Matty Moss Clark, who I did have an opportunity to sit through her teaching and her uh, her administering of music and what she believed in music. Uh, she always believed that you always put the best out front. If you can't play the song in the national stage, then you go home and practice and show us that, you, that you're good at home. And if we hear about you, maybe you get an opportunity, but you just don't show up and just start playing, which is why her, her daughter, uh, Twinkie Clark, was her musician of choice. Very rare when another musician got an opportunity to play. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. There's sometimes you just have to know where you are. And as the one, uh, I went to the Gospel Music Association. I was a member back in the 80s. And they, they told us, a bunch of musicians in a room, shake up the dust where you are and we'll hear about you. So that was, again, an encouragement that I knew to just get better. Keep getting better. Keep doing what you're doing. Share it as much as you can. And if, it's, if it makes dust where you are, We'll, we'll, we, we will hear of it. So I wanted to touch on one of the songs that uh, Dr. Clark wrote, which, which is sort of a, a staple of her. Um, I'm on my way to heaven. Is that the title? Let me make sure I wrote it down because I wanted to touch on it. Yeah, I'm on my way to heaven to meet the king. Now, this is one of those gospel songs that you say, okay, it's got jazz in it. Every time I have heard it, other people play it, and when I learned it, it's straight jazz. But we want to call it a a gospel song that ministers to people. Yes, the lyrics do minister to people, but what from a, from a music standpoint, it's straight jazz. So I'm going to touch on it because again, I don't want to be guilty from the uh, the YouTube community. Let's get this out of the way a little bit from the YouTube community that I am copywriting on someone's song. So I'm going to touch on it just a little bit while, while I talk through it. As it says, gospel, let me increase it a little bit. Many gospel songs emerge from traditional church hymns 
period. Over time, gospel began incorporating traits of secular music, particularly country music, blues, and ragtime, which made the music as entertaining as it was reverent. Now, let me get that out of the way. So, this was one of the gospel songs that was back in its day, all the churches wanted to sing. Again, I'm going to touch on it a little bit so that I don't get a copyright strike against me. I put on my headphones so I can hear it. That's not jazz. If that's not jazz, straight jazz. Straight jazz. But as a but as a young musician, who's going to teach me those chords? Who is going to instill in me a jazz style? As a young musician. Who's going to say, get your timing down, get your, get, your, get your chops down, get your runs down. We don't do this in anthems or in spirituals or in hymns, but now that we're doing this gospel sound, which moves, which inspires, which, which, which gets people off their seats and put down the hymnals and start to clap their hands. Now they say foot, hand clapping, foot, foot stomping music. How do you get a generation of musicians to accept this is now the new sound of gospel. And it didn't stay there. As I said, as the, as the larger choirs emerged, all of a sudden this sound even faded because a new sound came. Uh, and I'm gonna, not going to uh, be here too long, like, what, 30, 38 minutes so far, okay, I think I'm on time. A, a, a new sound began to emerge, that more contemporary sound. And then a, a different sound of gospel turned from contemporary to jazz, from jazz to classical, all still with the label of gospel. So in, in defense of my question, how can we, how can we keep, how can we, Find just what is that gospel sound? What, how do we? And I want to say we revive it because it's it's not dead, but how do we? How do we save it so that it can still be reverent and relevant in the face of today's music? Now, again, to say that oh I'm against what we call gospel now, or what we what is the what is the defining I'm always trying to find the correct word because again don't want to offend the current state of music in our in our churches but there was there was a sound that musicians were allowed to have back in my day that I don't recognize out of the musicians of today and to hear to not recognize it and I, again I, I can hear what they're doing, but there was another sound back in my day that I actually recognized. Welcome, Stanley. That um, that still moved me. Today's music, unless you're getting as emotional as the leader of a song in today's music, if you don't feel him, then you really can't 
you know, they want you to stand and lift your hands to the air and, and wave, look this way and do that. And I'm like, well, you know, back in my day, when the choir got up, we started to sing. You never tell people to stand up. They were up. Even the church mothers would get up on certain songs if, if we did a, a correct presentation of that song. You couldn't do the song, God is the joy of the strength of my life, and not get someone somewhere moved and cried. Got, you, you, got, you got emotion out of me whenever I hear the song, God is. But then you got emotion out of me if you play the hymn correctly. Because the, for me, it's, it was always how, to, uh, how the music and the lyrics match together. Today we have chords and lyrics. Not too much music, but chords. In fact, let me... Let me touch on that again, not to offend any copyrights. But today we have chords, chords and lyrics. I'll use this one song. You may know, you may know what this song is. Keep forgetting to put on my headphones. song is this what song is this one stop right there because I I probably just offended four or five songs with just those chords that yeah, you're correct break every chain but you could probably find four or five other songs four or five other songs gospel that has that same structure of chords maybe used backwards maybe use Instead of starting with the six, they start with the four and go to the six and to the five and to the one. And that's gospel in a sense. That's what is now covering the gospel that that brought me through as a musician. And then I began to see the changeover and adjust it to the changeover. Now, again, when I look at that song, I, I played it as as I saw it was being taught. And as it, and it sounded on the production, I would look at that and say, okay, what would I have done? I would have done this. I would have done this. I would have added this. I would put this in there and then made it a gospel sounding four chord song. Let me just read some of the comments. If church leadership does not preserve it and or introduce it, it will be lost among the younger congregations. You know, I, I have... Um, admiration for the younger congregations as they are leaving their home churches and starting their own and to watch them do it without um, fear because that's that's the word to use I've seen in my in my younger days as a church musician churches be birthed out of churches where whole families would leave because the elder felt he he wasn't going to get a seat as they say or pastorship at one church. So they would go out and start a storefront church and they take about they take their family with them and their cousins and they would start a church and then they would struggle. But these younger churches that are starting now, they got the lighting, they've got the musicians, they're putting up uh splash screens. I'm and I'm again I'm watching this on, on Facebook or on YouTube and I'm saying, Wow. It looked like somebody had a plan. They got the building. They've got chairs. It's not struggle church or struggle. It's not It's not the storefront of yesteryear when young people or when people leave one one ministry and then start a fresh one. So I, 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 I what's the word I want to use? I got to always try to find the right word. I'm, I'm encouraged that they put all of that vigor into what they believe. Sometimes younger people don't want to hear the the traditionalist sound of the old, of the elders. 
and I'm I'm not I'm in that been in that group for for a few years now, having a hard time for me dealing with being called an elder, but that's that's who I am. But that means I'm now charged with passing on knowledge. But um, I'd like to see them sometimes. I got someone in here who doesn't who doesn't need to be here. Let me take care of that. There we go. I like to be able to know that I'm passing on knowledge to someone who can actually appreciate that uh, knowledge. So, and um, podcasts like like this, uh, videos that I have posted over the years, is my way of passing on musical knowledge now that I am talking more where I'm looking to engage people in, into conversation I love to be able to have 10 young musicians now meet me in conversation and let's talk about what's your mindset as you prepare for each church service that you go to are you more concerned with the shout bump or are you concerned with the praise team music that you're going to be playing that's going to minister to those that are listening now, again, am I against the music that's happening today? No, I watched it more f from its very beginnings. Again, I, wanna, I don't want to infringe on someone's copyright. But I, I, I might do that. As the early praise and worship songs began to displace what I call the testimony songs and the, the songs that were choir, um, what was it? for the uh, that were choir centric and you began to cut down your choirs to 10 at that time 10 people doing the praise team i was there oh give thanks ah, let me get my my headphone oh give thanks unto the lord was one of those songs Okay, they weren't your traditional, you know, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me song. But I accepted the fact that this is a new age. Just as Oh Happy Day came in. Just as I could learn, oh, happy day, I said, okay, this is a now a new gospel, a praise and worship dominated gospel. And then as the, the, late, as the latter songs began to, began to come, I said, okay, I can be adjusted, ad adjustable, because the early praise and worship songs were What's the correct word? Again, I always want to try to find, to find the correct word. Were so professionally done to where they challenged you as a as a musician. The presence of the Lord is here. Wow, it took me a while. To figure that out but it was a challenge musically not a lot of churches would do that kind of music though why because it required to be a musician to be tightly locked into what was being presented so a lot of choirs on praise teams straight away then as the music began to again morph again and let me see let me give one that was um yeah, this one I think you should know. I'm trying to play it as straight as I 
can. quite like the album, but that's what I did to that song. I said, I got to give it more than the solo and everybody singing along with it. I had to fill it out musically so that I felt that I, so that I could be a little bit more accomplished in playing it. Again, didn't change the lyrics, didn't change the melody, didn't change all the chords, but I filled it out, which is what I have done for years. Put me behind a piano and give me a song. Yes, I give myself away. Give me a song that um, a song that I am behind musically playing, and I will take um, a music a musician's license and change the song. I say I got somebody else. I got to move off of here. That's why I like being able to do this. I don't know who you are, but you're now gone. So, and this is when, when you have an open, um, an open uh, video, people come in to plug stuff that shouldn't be there. So I, I'm, I got three eyes going, but this is where gospel music has evolved to. Even even I give myself away is old now. You don't hear that played anymore. Um, I'm not going to touch every praise by Hezekiah Walker because that is a um, the chords are tied to another song of my era. But again, it's built on four on built on four chords, and as a musician, you're allowed to go in to, and make um, ad adjustments to the song, which is what I did every time I played it. I put it in a different format. So, but the, the songs of today, to me, can't really match up to the songs of the 70s and the 80s, the 90s when you got the Kirk Franklin, the Fred Hammond. You think we can what? match up the songs of today from the songs of 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I think if you match them up lyric for lyric, you may find that the, oh, I think we can save gospel by teaching and singing hymns, anthems, and some of those more modern stuff out there, of course. Um, I've always wondered when a praise team is singing, are they singing to encourage the full congregation or just a small section of it? Because there are so many basic hymnal songs, which can be a praise song. If musically you adjust the music around it. Timothy Wright, the late, excuse me, the late Reverend Timothy Wright was a master of taking hymns and turning them into what I call pop, pop culture um, gospel. He took the song, Come Thou Almighty King, which is a quote unquote standard uh, gospel music song. Again, I'm not going to play too much of this because I don't want to fringe on copywriting. But Come Thou Almighty King is a hymnal. Uh, one of those staunch traditional hymnals.
Come the Almighty King, a staunch traditional hymn. But Timothy Wright looked at it and it says, hmm. How do you take a hymn like that and turn it into a pop hymn? But that was the, the, the godfather of gospel, Reverend Timothy Wright's way of interpreting, reinterpreting a hymn, keeping the words, but then allowing what he felt as a musician to say, hey, I like these lyrics, but we can do different. Keep the lyrics still for those who still know the lyrics, but completely change around the approach to a song. And uh, as a young musician, of course, I, I adapted. I bought every every album. I may still have some of them here. I don't have a, uh, a record player to play them on. But I learned every song on every one of those albums and tried to match what the, what the actual mu uh, musicians was playing. That's a different style of gospel. And some may say, well, uh, you know, you ruined that hymn. But if you had half, well, excuse me, three quarters of your church standing and, and singing in it and singing the words and, okay, he may not have used every, every verse from the hymn. He just needed a verse, a chorus, and a tag. And those how the Timothy Wright songs were all created. Verse, chorus, and then he put a, a tag behind it, a signature tag. Let me see. On this one was he, we come to praise thy name, right? Thy name. Thy name. Thy name. Thy name. Yeah. That was the vamp, as they say, or tag of, of that song. And you had huge numbers of churches singing those songs. Because they what they heard was a hymn repurposed. Now, if you start playing Come Thou Almighty King in the Methodist Church, you'll get the entire church singing that word for word and all the verses to it. But if you try the Timothy Wright version of Come Thou Almighty King, they'll be looking at you like, what? That's not Come Thou Almighty King. So to the listener, depending upon who your, who your listener was, that's who you tailored the music to. That's why I say this, this gospel uh, music, so much of it that changed churches that drew people to church people were you had when, when back in my day ushers would put chairs in the middle center aisle because you find couldn't find seats for people people would be holding seats for family members that were late all the time and the ushers would be having arguments in the service you can't hold that seat we got someone here who wants to sit the gospel music is what drew the largest congregations it's nice to say that the, the minister who was speaking had a word that was going to encourage people, but people came to hear the music. Uh, yes, uh, yes oh, J. Pat, welcome. Yes, that, that's, that's one of the uh, Timothy Wright, what I call uh, gospel pop songs. Right? Not, not, not being disrespectful, but songs that had a good pop sound to the, um, if you look at um, jazz, jazz has a, not jazz, but rock has a pop sound. It's, it's up tempo. It gets you moving. Gets you jumping. So I always call it uh, Timothy Wright pop song. He had um, what was the other one he did? Um, I'm trying to think. There were so many that was that that were hymns that he converted. What a friend we have in Jesus. I was actually with him, 1986 at the Church of God in Christ, aim the song is born concert when he taught his. What a friend we have in Jesus. The title of the song, of course, is. Hmm. No, is everything for God in prayer? I gotta remember now. What a friend we have in Jesus. Everything to God in prayer. Okay, I think that that was the title he used, but it was the words from "What a friend we have in Jesus." Again, I don't want to infringe on a copyright. But I want to touch on because this is this is the gospel 
that I came through that I had to learn and not all of it could be done in church. Not all of it could be done in church. But if you had a good choir that would that was attentive in how you would teach them. Temple pop, popping, running, um, and it was using the lyrics from "What a Friend We Have in Jesus." All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege! What a privilege it is to carry everything to God. Yes, take it to the Lord in prayer. Yes, everything to God, to God in prayer. So, as a young musician, to be able to hear how he would take a hymn and give it a nice pop sound. Now, it, everything didn't pop, I'll put it like that. There were some songs where he actually put a different tempo to it. Uh, what was that song he did? Again, this is the, the sound of gospel that uh, today's church culture, I can't say that you, you can't abandon something you've never heard when your generation, I think Generation Z is who we now call them the people who are in their teens, late teens and early 20s, if you never heard this music, then you can't really say, oh, I left something or I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring something. What we don't have is an opportunity for those of us that came up during that day to get together six or seven voices and do a recording of some of those older songs and say, hey, this is what this song sounded like back then. For them to go, oh, wow. Um... What is that song they always like to jump on? They jump on the song. I just had it in my head. It's an A flat. No, that's well, it's, no, it's done in in G flat also. I heard someone else doing it. It's not, it, may, it may come back to my head. It's it's an it's a song from the past that they're actually actually singing parts of it now. Trying to remember what was that song? Ah, I don't. I don't want to go look it up because I don't want to have this this stream going that long. But that sound of, of gospel that was unmistakable when a church had windows and they didn't have so much air conditioning. They had fans. They would open up those windows. The gospel songs would start, and you could hear it a half a block away. You knew I got to get to the church because that's the song I want to hear. I can't say whether or not, because again, we're not really using physical buildings right now with the with the current state of the the pandemic in the United States. But I can't say whether or not there those that are having in 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 service uh, services so that people are are rushing to go hear what's the latest song that the praise team is singing, because choirs are for a better better point, really not really appropriate right now you don't need a group of people singing over each other and because you don't unfortunately we don't know how the spread is spreading so much it is through our country right now so less is is, is better but for those that that are still participating you find yourself what they call singing to stems which is a musical track that has skilled singers singing in the track and musicians are playing to that track and the leader is singing to that track knowing that he's going to have the correct vocals to promote or to present that song and stems allow the person who's running it to be able to repeat a verse twice go on to the next verse repeat the vamp three times and because it's it's a pre-programmed track it makes it sound like your singers are better than they are. It makes your musicians at times sound like they're better than they are because if they miss a note, the sound from the audio from the stem 
covers it up. Let's see, Jay Pat. Before I joined, I was looking up old hymns. The story you're telling sounds like the beginning of the Carlton Pearson intro. I think number three. Um, yes, I've I've watched his his presentations about the old hymns several times. Whenever he would come on Facebook, um, I think last year when this, when we first started locking us down, he did a he did a whole series on some of those conventions that he would have. Again, another uh, gifted musician, singer, who kept alive some of those songs by bringing together a lot of the people who were a part of that. When you, um, when you have a chance to, yes, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Zula Street albums, when you have a chance to use to use uh, YouTube and search for gospel songs, and you look for the era, put in 1970, 1980, 1990, and see what were the songs that were that were prevalent then you find that there weren't a lot of hits because the ones that were hits, those were the ones that everybody was singing. There were a lot more songs, I should say. That's probably what I meant to say. They they may say the 10 most popular songs of the 80s. Well, they were probably 60 or 70 songs or more. All of them didn't rise to the level of Because the hit they considered to be how many, how many um, purchases, how many people either requested it from a radio station or how many purchases were made from at that time you were buying them you were buying albums albums or or cassettes so they they based it on how many sales of that album determine whether or not the songs on that album were considered the most popular but you go to your local church and then you listen to well what is the choir capable of singing i think when when gospel changed over into the more contemporary gospel again still the gospel sound but a more contemporary gospel, you found that the James Hall songs were unsingable from your local church choirs because they did not have singers from music and arts. Music and arts, it was high school music and arts, I think, here in New York. I believe he's, he's out of that, that lineage, lineage of musicians. He came up within the Brooklyn sound with the Institutional Church of God in Christ, which had tremendous singers and musicians that would come there just to be a part of that ministry, so that 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 sound became iconic in the in the East Coast. Of course, now the West Coast created their own sound. You had the L.A. Mass Choir. Goodness, the songs I had to learn from them were challenging as well. You had to have a good choir in order to do the songs from the from from the L.A. Mass Choir group. And then you had the growing up of these groups from. Of course, Chicago Mass, uh, Chicago Mass Choir, and, and Clay Evans, and um, who was the other guy? It was Clay Evans, and there was someone else we learned. Milton, Milton Bingham. Yes, how could I forget the Milton Bingham songs, where he really turned gospel singing from a choir standpoint. You know, set the bar. I, I put it like that, where you had live horns, and you had keyboards, and, and bass, and guitars, and drums. And a, and a huge choir behind you in a church setting. Now, I never had that complement of musicians around me back in my day, but I learned those songs if though I was a part of the album. So I just wanted to sound like whatever the piano player was doing or whatever the organ player was doing, and I couldn't mimic anybody else. Then from the pop side, you had Timothy Wright, and then you had John P. Key. And John P. Key brought up the, the southern end of gospel music. His style was more fusion, more of the, uh, you could say it was contemporary, but he put the pizzazz in that gospel sound. No one could forget um, Jesus is Real. That was everyone's song. When Jesus is Real came out, and here's what gospel music did back in that day. Whoever had the hit, everybody wanted to sing it. So they were constantly knocking each other off the top listing of what choirs wanted to sing. If Hezekiah Walker came out with a song like um, I hear the song in my head. The Lord will make a way somehow. 
That knocked off everybody from the top. Now all the choirs wanted to learn that one. When Kirk Franklin came in, he came in with his smooth gospel sound. Chords that, again, you didn't, and I, and I didn't really want to omit um, Thomas Whitfield. His music was uh, a study in jazz. Some songs you could, when he kept it straight gospel, you could get with it. But when he kept it jazz, you were like, oh, wait a minute. What, as again, as a young musician, I don't have a booklet showing me this is his jazz turn to this chord in the song. So you learned as much as you could, and the choir director would throw her hands up. How do I teach this? I still learn those changes, though. I think from Tim Thomas Whitfield, his most sing sung songs was "All I Need," um, "Let Every Breath," "Let Everything That Hath Breath Praise the Lord." Um, Oh, how I love Jesus! Again, taking a a hymn and turning it into a gospel jazz. Is it gospel? Yeah, gospel gospel jazz song. Still relevant today, though. I think if these younger musicians would let's do a study on the Thomas Whitfield songs for the time we had him here with us on on Earth, their heads would be blown off as to wow. Look at that change. Look at this change. How did he get from here to there and then back to here? That that kind of music. But and I've been here longer than I wanted to be, over an hour already, but I appreciate everyone who has come in. I just wanted to have a conversation because the we I'm going to do I've done my part, I think, in trying to keep anthems and hymns and spirituals relevant in the ears of those who want to hear it and available to those who want to learn how to play it. And I will continue to do that. I have some older videos that I have on my channel that had did not have the, the, the better sound that I have now. I'm going to do my own research and say, which ones do I, well, I'll, some of them have really got like 40,000 views. But if they if they look like they're not getting any real traction lately, because I can look that up, I may I will re redo them and then reintroduce them with a much better sound and a little better quality of workmanship. Sometimes when I was doing those early videos, I was such a rush to get it out there, I left in mistakes purposely so they could sound like it was a live musician. And now I want to clean up those mistakes and do a more polished presentation, give it a little more. Um, technical versus hey let's just get it out there so we can get get on to the next one so just to keep the sound of gospel music alive thank i thank you for those who have come in who have conversation with me I'd like to acknowledge those that are here v force you were the first to come in Nepal from mexico thanks you for again coming in dalton jr elisha 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 make it that correctly You're always great good to see you in here and spending some time uh, F. Stanley 35, appreciate you stopping by, Fernando. Thanks you for coming. Uh, I had a couple of uh, trolls. I got rid of them. Uh, J. Pat, you can if you create melodies. I want to see if I got that. Oh, okay, so it's about hymns. So make sure I didn't miss any conversation. J. Pat, thank you for coming in, spending some time with me. This will cost stay up on my channel, and I will share it with my YouTube, excuse me, with my Facebook page also so that some information that I've spoken about they can actually research themselves um, as I say I'm going to continue these podcasts I'm not trying to find out when is a good time uh, to to go live it's about midnight now didn't expect to be on this long but I've got 10 people in the room I've never had this many in the room uh, not everybody commented, but it's good to know that uh, somebody's up this late. So I may look at um, doing specially targeted uh, podcasts, dealing with music, and talking about anything that can help um, uh, give clarity to the approach to music, the approach I use, the approach I hear other musicians use. Again, I, I never like tan up, tan, uh, doing a critique of, way, of a style of another musician, but then it's good to get a, an insight from, from one musician who knows how to 
take someone's chords and say, this is what he did in this part of the song, and this is why it fits. As you heard me playing that last Timothy Wright song, those were the chords that he was using when he taught the song. Okay, we got someone else I need to remove. There we go. But I thank you all for coming in, for spending some time with me. As always, if you have any questions, or comments, or concerns, please leave me a comment. I read, all, I read them all now, and I will respond in kind. Thanks for coming in. Everybody be blessed. Take care now. Bye.